Okay, so volcanoes. Um, this is going to be our first of many catastrophic events. Um, not necessarily one that affects us here in North Dakota, but you may go and visit places such as Hawaii or the state of Washington, or hopefully you get outside of the U.S. and you go to places like the Andes in South America, um, places like that. And sorry, something in my eye. And you might experience or at least go and visit a volcanic site, hopefully not active, but you could. So let's talk about volcanoes. We are working with Middle School Earth Science Standard 2-2 and 3-2, which states that you will be able to construct an explanation based on evidence for how geoscience processes have changed our surface over varying times and spatial scales. This one really hits in on that because obviously with the creation of a volcano, you actually have creation of brand new land. Um, so that. Then also you'll be able to explain what causes catastrophic events to form and occur and then use data to predict and mitigate future events. So how is it that we can tell that a volcano is due for an eruption almost any day now versus, yeah, no, that one's not going to go off for like a couple hundred years. Okay. And you specifically are going to be able to explain what causes volcanoes to form and where they form. So make sure you have your volcano notes in front of you for sure your whole group notes and let's get going. So what is a volcano? So a volcano is essentially this vent or an opening within the Earth's crust in which melted or molten rock is able to escape. Now remember, because we've talked about this already, magma is this molten rock underneath Earth's surface. It does not become lava until it meets Earth's surface. Now, it was brought up even just today that like, oh, well, gee, what about like as it's coming up the like actual like volcano about to erupt? Technically, until it leaves the top of the volcano, it's still magma. It's still within Earth's crust. It's just Earth's crust is far more like vertical and elongated rather than like right at the surface. Um, also had a learner today explain to me that, so volcanoes are like zits and they are. <laughs> it's disgusting, but they are. If you think of it that way, like it is a zit on earth's surface or it's skin. So that's a volcano. It's an opening in which, um, molten or melted rock is able to escape from the um, inner mantles, asthenosphere, to the surface. So how does a volcano form and where? Well, it really can form just about anywhere. Typically, though, we find a majority of our volcanoes that are forming along plate boundaries, and that's because this is where there are natural spaces in between the... Um, in between the crust that allows this magma to actually escape far easier. So when magma erupts onto Earth's surface, it's usually along those plate boundaries, but every once in a while you get this really fun like anomaly that we call hot spots. And this is where the crust is rather thin. Um, and the magma is able to kind of just push its way up without having that like split like we would think. Um, this is how Hawaii formed. Um, most convergent boundaries typically are going to have volcanoes, but divergent boundaries do as well. Um, they're just not nearly as eruptive. They're constantly kind of spewing sort of a thing, but it's not like the big poof, sort of like volcano. If you think at the mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the two plates are moving apart from each other, you obviously have magma working its way to the surface to create brand new land, but it's just kind of like filling in that space slowly. Um, versus at convergent boundaries, you get a lot more of that pressure and a lot more of those very explosive sorts of eruptions. So where do they form? Convergent boundaries. So this is what I'm kind of talking about. So you have where you have the um, oceanic crust going underneath the continental crust, and you're forming all of this pressure. Okay, now if we want to go back to our zit 
phenomena, we can literally talk about like those ones that are super deep. I have one on my lip right now. It's annoying, but super deep that you know as soon as you go to like pop it is like boom. Um, that's essentially what happens at convergent boundaries. So where it's coming together, you're creating all this extra like pressure, which forces the magma upward and to finally erupt. Okay, then you have divergent boundaries. So you have two plates that are moving apart from one another and the magma is just kind of filling in the gaps and the spaces because earth doesn't like to have openings because it's just it's not comfortable it's not a state of normalcy or homeostasis it needs something in those spaces so that's where magma just kind of like flows and fills in the space um you want a real world example because this is just why not? We're already talking zits. Let's talk about a cut. So if you were to get a paper cut, especially, you obviously don't have like an artery that's like spewing friggin' blood everywhere, but rather it's just kind of seeping and filling in that space. And eventually it clots up, it forms a scab. That's essentially what's happening at divergent zones is filling in that space to create new land. Sorry if you have a weak stomach. I probably should have put a trigger warning at the beginning of this um, PowerPoint. Um, then you have hot spots. That is what's going on over here in Hawaii, where you have this um, oceanic plate that's relatively like solid. You're, Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific plate. Like, let's be real. But you get this one spot where all the magma and stuff is just extra hot. There's more, maybe there's more convection currents that are really just like pushing that one up um, or the magma up to where it starts to kind of melt away at that crust and allows for it to seep. And the thing with Hawaii is that it seeped over a long period of time and eventually created all of these islands because it just kind of kept flowing. It's again, not those big eruptions, but just filling up that space. And then it mounds on top of each other because plates are moving very, very slowly. It mounds and then it starts creating these islands. Uh, the big island of Hawaii, like that took hundreds of millions of years to get to that point versus like, I believe there's another island being created right now, but it won't even come up above the ocean's surface for another million years. Then you have to think that that rock has to like settle and then you have to have um, different birds bringing over seeds and things like that to where then you can start actually growing plants to support life um, to where you're looking at probably two million years before that island is even ready to be inhabited by birds, yet alone larger animals that would eventually migrate there and how they get there, who knows? Probably some sort of, if humans are still around, we had something to do with it, I'm sure, by physically transporting them over, um, things like that. So just kind of something interesting to think about, but those are hot spots. So those are the three different ways that we can have volcanoes. Now you're like, but gee, there's transformative boundaries. Why are there no volcanoes at transformative boundaries? I'm not saying that they're not, but remember transformative boundaries is where they're just sliding past each other. So yes, there's this space, but it's really just going back and forth to where magma doesn't really get up in there. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm not, again, not saying that there isn't, but the likelihood of it far less than at one of these sorts of spots. And that brings us to the Ring of Fire. So the Ring of Fire is this area that falls along the Pacific Plate um, that we have an absurd amount of volcanoes and an absurd amount of earthquake activity occurring here. You can see all of those red dots are volcanoes and earthquakes, okay? That is a significant amount versus you look around the rest of the planet. Yes, we have some up here in like China, India sort of a thing. We have some over here in the Middle East, um, but a majority of them stick to this line, which just so happens to follow 
the Pacific Plate. So we call it our ring of fire. Well, gee, it's not a ring. It doesn't connect. Work with me, people. I got nothing else, okay? Um, but we can expect to see a majority of our volcanoes and a majority of earthquake activity occurring around these boundaries. Um, this is where you have the Pacific Plate moving in relatively this direction. Okay, relatively. Oh, I've lost my cursor. Okay, and then you have this plate essentially just like following it. And then you have this plate over here, the North American and the South American, that are moving in this direction. So that's how you get all these issues. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the ring of fire. This is just where we're going to see a vast majority of all this activity occurring. Not saying that that's the only place, but a majority of it for the world. Now, what factors do scientists monitor to help to evaluate the possibility of future eruptions? So predicting a volcanic eruption is a complete and utter science, and it's still a guessing game. So what scientists are mainly looking at, like the reason why we knew Kilauea and Mauna Loa were, um, these are both volcanoes in Hawaii, um, the reason why we knew they were going to become active in the nearest future, and they did, is because they were monitoring things like earthquake activity. Typically, if you get more earthquake activity, you're going to see more eruption. Um, changes in shapes of the volcano. Mount St. Helens, they knew that Mount St. Helens was going to erupt back in 1971 or 72 because all of a sudden, it almost got this like bulge on its side. Um, and all of a sudden, meaning like over like a couple weeks, I believe. Um, I have to do my research on Mount St. Helens again. Um, so that sort of stuff. Gas emissions. Obviously, we start seeing like smoke and stuff coming out of a mountain that didn't have smoke coming out of it in the more recent past. Probably something's not sitting right. Um, but then also, volcanoes are creatures of habit in a sense, where they have an eruption history. And as long as we've been documenting it um, and monitoring it, we can start to guess like, oh, it has been such and such amount of years since the last eruption. It's probably due for one within the next five to 10. Um, but again, we can't say it's going to erupt next year because um, they're not that predictable. But they do tend to erupt fairly regularly. Um, we have an entire branch of the government. It is the United States Geologic Survey that has established volcano observations. Obviously, we don't have one in North Dakota or even on the East Coast, but rather all of them at this point in time have been set up over on the West Coast in Hawaii because that's where we have our volcanoes. Mount St. Helens in Washington, um, plus like all along Washington and Oregon's um, western um, coast has a couple volcanoes. Um, and then obviously Hawaii is just a giant volcano. Um, but they set up sites to monitor these things. And we know we don't need to waste the money out here in the Midwest because we don't have any and there's nothing we need to monitor. Maybe Yellowstone, that's about it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, that's how we're able to kind of sort of know where one would form because we're looking at the patterns and it would be along plate boundaries. So that is your whole group. If you're sticking around, awesome. If not, see you later. Remember your champs expectations and we'll keep going. So there are four different types of volcanoes. Um, we have shield volcanoes, composite volcanoes, cinder cone volcanoes, and then calderas. Um, calderas are kind of like aftermath volcanoes, um, but can still be active themselves. So bear with me. I'm going to give you some real world examples of each of them. Um, and some of them have links if you wanted to go and see um, videos or more specific pictures and things like that. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. This may help you in the future. So a shield volcano. Generally, a shield volcano has the shape of a shield. Weird. 
Um, very gentle slopes. Typically, it's made of um, basaltic lavas. And remember, basalt is a really heavy igneous rock, um, high in iron, things like that. Um, and the reason why, because of the, bas the basaltic lavas, the fact that they're very slow, like because it's so heavy, it can't really like explode by any means. It just kind of dribbles. Um, so we typically see shield volcanoes along those divergent boundaries because it's just filling in the gaps. It's filling in the gaps and just kind of building up. You can see in this diagram that it is layer after layer after layer after layer of lava flows that have just solidified and created this new mountain. Um, Mauna Loa in Hawaii is a great example of a shield volcano, and it is actually currently active. Um, I don't remember exactly what this YouTube video is. I think it's one of the more act, um, the more recent, um, like eruptions, and just how slow it kind of goes. So, and what's going on, how people are dealing with it, that kind of fun jazz. So, those are shield volcanoes. Looks like a shield. Composite volcanoes. Now, composite volcanoes um, tend to be very much like a mountain. It looks like a mountain. I don't even want to say that because these are not the volcanoes when, I'm, when I say, hey, picture a volcano. These aren't the ones you're even thinking of. Okay. Gentler sort of a slope, but a little bit more steep than those shield volcanoes because it is made up of a lot more andesitic and rhyolitic lava. So it's a lot lighter. So you can get more of that explosion sort of a thing. Mount St. Helens in Washington, again, great example. This was a composite volcano. Um, it is now a composite volcano with a caldera at the top um, vent. So yeah, um, but composite volcanoes tend to be just more mountainous, um, less like layer after layer sort of a thing. Okay, so again, another video link if you wanted to see some. Cinder cones. These are what you think of when I say, hey, think of a volcano. This is those tall, steep, um, typically have very um, like explosive um, releases versus the other two thus far. Um, but it's, again, a lot of bas uh, basaltic, but it's a lot lighter basaltic um, lava. Typically, you're going to find more of these cinder cones around those convergent boundaries. Uh, Wizard Island in Oregon is a great example of a cinder cone volcano. Um, it is not currently active, I don't believe. I'd have to look into it again, but last year it wasn't active. This year, I don't think it is either. Um, but this is what you would imagine when I say, imagine a volcano now, imagine a volcano erupting. Cinder cones is what you're thinking. Then we have calderas. Calderas, like with Mount St. Helens, can form after an explosion and stay at the top of like that mountain, um, things like that. Or you have things like Yellowstone in Wyoming, where it once was this huge volcano. Yellowstone is technically over a hot spot. Um, this huge volcano that had a massive explosion to where it essentially blew the actual volcanic mountain away, leaving behind the depression or bowl, in a sense, behind. So if you look at this top, you get a lot of, um, you get this big explosion to where all of this eventually gets blown away and you're left with like this bowl. Typically at that point, after a massive explosion, it takes hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of years in order to actually gain enough pressure back to create another massive volcano. And in the case of Wyoming, because it is over a hot spot, that hot spot has now started to shift away and almost go dormant um, to where you don't really have that heat so much anymore. So you have this bowl that starts getting filled in with water and it starts creating its own ecosystem. So you have the caldera of Yellowstone and it's 
absolutely gorgeous. You have such a diverse um, ecosystem in those in those areas. You can literally just look up Volcano Caldera and you get these like idealistic island vacation sort of things where you can go swimming in a caldera of a dormant or a, an extinct volcano. And it's just, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. Another YouTube video if you kind of wanted to see what's going on over in Yellowstone um, with that stuff. Now, what affects an eruption? What is going to tell you that this um, volcano is going to have a massive violent eruption versus just the like bleh, dribbly eruption? It all comes down to the chemistry of the magma. How much water vapor is in there? How much silica is in there? How much of the heavy um, igneous rock formations, basalt, rhyolite, andesite, things like that, how much of that is within that specific magma? Okay, obviously the heavier it is, the like more pressure could build up, but the heavier it is could also mean then that it's just gonna dribble if it doesn't have enough time to build up that pressure. So things like that. Um, how quiet the volcano has honestly been in the more recent past. Is it making big grumbles? Is it having a lot more um, earthquake activity? Things like that. Just what is it doing? If it's really, really quiet, it may not be anything huge. Um, versus typically we find more of those earthquakes quake prone areas and things like that to have more explosive um, volcanic eruptions. Um, and all of that just leads to how violent it is. Obviously, the more explosive, the more violent it becomes, the more issues we have with the things on the coming slides um, and things like that. You have just like, I think it's called slow flow where is like Mauna Loa doing those sorts of things to the Strombolian, which is like this big kaboom, like what Mount St. Helens did in the 70s. So um, yeah, all of that affects what type of an eruption you are going to have from a volcano. Now, the things that we really need to be cautious of as people is less the actual volcano itself and more these things that come with it. So first of all, the lava flow. Um, if you die from a lava flow, part of me wants to just say it was on you. Lava flows are so slow moving. You literally have to stand there trying to get a selfie and then you trip and fall into it um versus you are able to walk away from the lava flow if it started to come near you so there's a youtube video just to kind of show you how slowly it moves and honestly how ridiculous you would need to be in order to die from a lava flow so yeah, but it's literally just like the flowing river of the magma coming down. Um, rarely deadly because its speed is just so slow. It causes a lot of damage. Not going to downplay that. But actual human fatalities, slim. Um, Ashfall. This is probably one of the largest concerns we should have with um, any volcanic eruption. And that is because the ash fall is all of that ash and debris that's being flung up into the air um, and lingering there. So imagine like if you were to be at a campfire in the summer sort of a thing. Once you have some wood that has kind of sort of turned into this ash and it goes up and it just kind of hovers and it flows and all of this. That's essentially what's being tossed out by these volcanoes and just lingering in our air. So people who already have breathing troubles, um, asthma, heart disease, things like that, like this is really no bueno, but it just amplifies it that much more. We have a lot of issues with air traffic. So airplanes and things being able to get around and whatnot. Um, I think for a while there, because of what was happening with Mauna Loa and, um, Oh my goodness, I can't think of a second one right now. 
but because of that, there was quite a bit of significant asphalt where you could not travel between specific islands, depending on the way that the wind was blowing, um, just because it would all get into there. So another YouTube video linked here, just in case you wanted to see. Um, and I believe this one also goes through like, oh, what are some like precautions you should take as a person and especially a person of already like not great breathing. Um, the last two usually come with more of the significant sort of eruptions. Um, mud flows and pyroclastic flows. So mud flows is you have to imagine if you are looking at a volcanic mountain mountains are at such an elevation to where they are able to maintain snow and ice um, beyond a certain altitude because of just how cold it is. Um, so there's ice and snow. Now what happens is once you start getting eruption or even just activity, all of that thermal energy, all of that heat from the center of the earth coming up into this volcanic vent it's going to instantaneously melt your snow and ice, which then mix with your mud and comes down the side of this mountain. Those are deadly. You cannot outrun those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so there's a YouTube video that explains it a little bit better um, linked in there, but it's essentially just this massive amount of water and mud and rock and debris coming down a very steep slope. All of this added together doesn't do well with humans and vehicles, and things like that. Um, pyroclastic flow, um, pyro meaning fire, um, clastic meaning um, rock, bits of rock so put it together you have fire rock flowing um this is a fast moving avalanche of hot gas ash and rock literally coming down the mountain at you there is almost a guaranteed 100 percent fatality if you were to encounter this um to where yeah that's what's going on not great Again, another video, I think this one is actually how to survive or what to do if, an, if a volcano erupts, that sort of a thing. Um, so these are things that can truly affect our environment and our life um, if volcanoes were to erupt. Um, now, when it comes to affecting the climate, so we talk a lot about climate um, during third and fourth quarter because that's kind of like our big spiel. Okay, um, so if you can imagine the amount of ash and gas and debris that volcanoes are spewing directly up into our atmosphere, we could have a serious issue. There was an, there was a volcano I believe it was over in the Samoan Islands. Um, there for sure was one that just erupted a couple of years ago, and they were very concerned that this one was going to be a repeat of what brought on the year of no summer. Now, clearly, we still had summer, um, but what happens is after this very large volcanic eruption, it spews so much ash and debris up into the atmosphere that that ash and debris lingers, and it actually reflects sunlight back out into space before it can even come into the stratosphere and the troposphere where we are to keep the earth at its very comfortable 32 degree like average um that sort of a thing to where our summer months were two degrees cooler than average to where it caused this such a significant um, climate change that it doesn't feel like actual summer and that it's actually very, very concerning for the health of our planet um, and things like that. So we talked about this with the death of the dinosaurs. It wasn't so much the actual meteor that came and struck Earth, but rather the debris it then sent into our atmosphere coming down as those like hell balls or however they explained it. 
But then all of that debris continues to linger and it then sent the earth into a massive ice age because it just wasn't able to get the same amount of thermal energy necessary to maintain the temperature that we are so used to um, and literally sustains life. So those are some of the major effects we really have to keep into consideration when we're looking at volcanic activity. Um, we have geologic proof that there have been massive amounts of volcanic activity that led to multiple mass extinctions, um, including the Permian or the Great Death of 96% of all life. Yeah, um, that is so far shown to be because of volcanic eruptions. Now, we would have to have multiple volcanic eruptions and multiple sizable volcanic eruptions over a very short period of time in order for things like that to start occurring, but still good to keep in mind. So that should be it for your volcano notes. If you have any questions, let me know. Make sure that you complete your notes, you submit them online, and there are exit flips that go along with this, okay? Let me know if you have any questions. Awesome, thanks.